All right, it's 10.32 here in uh, sunny or rainy California. And uh, welcome everybody to our webinar, Achieving Complete Agility with Continuous Debugging and Continuous Observability. Um, today we have a very special guest, a Tom from Lightrun. We'll introduce him in a sec, uh, but let's start with, if you're not familiar, what is JFrog, why we're here, what are we talking about? So a couple of, couple of words about JFrog. Um, it's a company founded in 2008, uh, more than um, 600 employees, um, more than six, almost 6,000 customers. Um, and you can, see, you can see the numbers here. Um, obviously, um, we're very proud in the number of customers and users that we have. And our goal is to make them happy by allowing them release faster with better quality. So it's kind of a little bit of our customers, but you know what, let's get to the, uh, to the meat of today's webinar. My name is Baruch Sadogurski. I'm the Chief Sticker Officer of JFrog, also Head of Developer Advocacy. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter and we can continue our conversation there. We have a packed webinar today, so it might happen that we won't get to all your questions and comments, follow me on Twitter. Let's continue the conversation over there. Uh, we're going to talk about two parts of software journey, if you like. And I'm going to talk with you about the first one, and Tom is going to talk with you about the second one. So the first part of the journey is how we get the software out there. And we do it basically in three steps. We source the components that we need to create our software. And today, as you probably know, 80 to 90% of all software is built of, on third party open source components that you go ahead, find, and then incorporate into your, into your um, software. It starts with the Docker base image, but it's also all the dependencies of whatever you are using to write your code. The second one will be develop. And that's the part that we all know and love when we write our code. And, and we use the components that we sourced and kind of glue them together and then build it, of course, with the CI server of our choice. And then the third part is how do we make sure that the software is, is getting there to, their, to the customers and the users that are intended to use our software. So this is kind of the, the journey of the software all the way to the develop to, to the customer. And um, I'm going to um, show you a little bit in detail how it actually works. So everything starts with the development team who is sourcing, right? We spoke about sourcing. So they go ahead and search for the components that they need. And the components then declared in the way they are declared in, on the stack that the, the developers use. And then they run the local build that tries to fetch the dependencies from, it will be JFrog Artifactory, obviously. And this is where Artifactory helps sourcing those components. If those components are not found, Artifactory will make sure that they are retrieved from the remote repositories, registries, and sources that are needed for a, to find those components. And uh, then um, once this is done, the developers commit their their code, commit their changes to the, to the version control. And this is where the CI kicks in, the build, the build server, the CI server, and it goes and runs exactly the same build that the developer run. Uh, now, not only the build is run, there is also information which is collected using JFrog means, and that's either it's our own CI server, JFrog pipelines, or um, it's the plugins that we have for Jenkins, Bamboo, um, Team City, and more. Or it's the JFrog CLI that runs the build, orchestrates the build, and makes sure that the information is collected in any CI server of your choice. So obviously, the, 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 the components that we need to build are retrieved from Artifactory now, and they're obviously there. And then um, the, the what we build is deployed to Artifactory together with all the metadata that we collected. Once this is done, and once the sources are converted to binaries, now the journey to production starts. And it's, um, it's a journey because we take our software through a bunch of quality gates. 
that check our software and contribute metadata about it. It can be your um, QA, performance testing, smoke testing, security testing done with JFrog X-Ray actually, um, or any other type of checks that you wanna run that contributes metadata and promote the artifact through quality gate store production. Once the artifact is, is, is signed off to production, this is where we go and distribute it. We can use JFrog distribution and artifactory edges to um, roll out to a remote distribution, or we can deploy to production using Kubernetes 90% or anything else, and then we get our software to production. So JFrog platform is there for every step on the way on this journey of your code from your fingertips or actually other people's fingertips because we're talking about source, uh, sourcing all the way to production to your users and customers. And when we talk about sourcing and developing and distributing, so Artifactory is there to find and cache the artifacts and JFrog XR is there to make sure that the artifacts that you are using, the third party dependencies are secure. In the development stage, you have the artifactory gain. This is where your dependencies come from and your artifacts are deployed. JFrog X-Ray, again, make sure that the security and the license are compliant. JFrog Pipelines as our solution for continuous integration and continuous delivery. And JFrog CLI, if you want to collect this information from other CI servers. When you go and distribute, use Artifactory to distribute to your internal users or Artifactory with CDN enabled for distribution to external users. Use JFrog distribution together with JFrog Edge to distribute to whatever Edge uh, nodes you need to distribute. And it can uh, even go inside your uh, Kubernetes cluster, inside your last mile with peer-to-peer -to -peer topology distribution. So this is all um, obviously works, right? We are here because because it's been it's been proven and well, and and it gives you a lot of confidence about the quality of software that you take to production. But what's next? What happens after you put your software out there? What happens next is the customer is there to interact with your software. And this is where the real test actually begins because the only quality that matters is the quality that customer experiences. And the only experience that matters is customer experience. And today, Tom is gonna to show us how you take the software that you took through your entire pipeline and you are pretty confident in its quality and make sure that not only you're confident in this quality, but it actually produces the right customer experience. So with that, Tom, take it away. All right, Bo, thank you very much for that introduction. I think it kind of ramps up exactly to what I want to talk about. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, uh, all right. And uh, first of all, a brief introduction. My name is Tom Grenot. I'm a developer advocate working for a company called Lightrun. I'm a bit branded today, you might have noticed. And uh, I have my Twitter handles and GitHub handles right here. It's Tom Grenot, not very complicated. Uh, my email as well, feel free to reach out. My inbox and my uh, DMs are open. And uh, let's get to it. So let's talk about software. Uh, we have all of these things that happen before we actually get our software into production. We have these uh, processes and these programmers that we hire as and these infrastructure that we set up and all those nice things in the way that get us into a running piece of production software. But the only thing that matters, as Bauer just mentioned, is this little box on the right, this box that says production. And um, as software engineers, as a discipline, we got pretty good at getting to production fast. We learned how to build tooling and uh, infrastructure and processes that get us into production as fast as possible. Actually, um, uh, JFrog wrote a book about it, and Bao specifically, called Liquid Software. Uh, and that book, among other things, details the concept of a CI CD pipeline, continuous integration, continuous deployment pipeline. It basically enables you to get that piece of software, those lines of code written on your developers' machines, all the way into production as fast as possible. And that's exactly the slides Bauch showed you um, before. But again, as Bauch mentioned, uh, that's only half of the equation. 
We haven't actually talked about the entire experience, the actual thing that matters. Because keep in mind, the thing that makes our company money, the key, thing that keeps us on the payroll, the thing that actually is important is the experience of the customer. And um, the live piece of software that's currently being run in production has this enormous amount of unknowns attached to it. Uh, running software in the wild is objectively complicated. It's hard. And the reasoning is the reason behind it is, is there's the a multitude of things that are happening there. So we have users coming in and using our software in a way that we have not intended it to, not to speak of malicious usage, right? Which is a whole different uh, part of the game and that we also have to account for. We have third party services, APIs, for example, that we rely on, that we build our software with the base um, agreement and understanding that they work properly, acting up in ways we did not expect expect. And um, because we are more and more, um, as time goes by, rely on infrastructure built by vendors and, and third party providers, um, we have bottlenecks that occur from their, their own uh, problems and also bottlenecks that occur from the way we um, structure our own infrastructure. So if we work in a microservices architecture, there are all these weird bottlenecks that can happen between the API gateway, the downstream services, the databases, all sorts of weird infrastructure failures. This battlefield, sorry, this battlefield prompted this uh, line of new professions, and I'm, I'm putting new in quotes because they're not actually new professions. They have been around for many, many years, just in different names. And those are people, you know, kind of the, the ones who will fight the good fight, the first line of firefighters uh, in the way to making sure our, our production software works properly. They have different names in different companies. Um, some companies, Google actually, um, coined the term site reliability engineer. I'm a former SRE um, and they are called in various ways in of course, various companies, uh, production engineers, uh, platform uh, engineers, um, uh, high-end support engineers. It really depends on the company you work for. Um, and also, of course, at the same time that there are, there are dedicated personnel uh, working to you know, fight a good fight, you have engineers who are part of the product team who build this product, who are on call, making sure that those, those uh, pieces of software actually work in production. And while the uh, professions are a bit different and the kind of terminology is a bit different and what they do is a bit different, there is a commonality. There is a common interface they all interact with to better understand the software we're running in production. And what, uh, what I gathered here is a, a somewhat rough list, a somewhat rough division of all of the kind of single things that they do in order to better understand what is going on in our production software. I call this the production observability toolbox. Uh, the set of tools these personnel use in order to understand the production software Better. Now, I will again mention that this is a rough division, and I think most of the tooling in the space fits at least one of those categories. Some tools fit two categories, um, but it is uh, a kind of a nice overview, a kind of like talking points that we can go over in order to better understand the field. But before we dive into each and one of those specific tools, let's take a moment to discuss uh, observability, this kind of concept that's being thrown around uh, quite a lot recently, and we actually named our toolbox after it. Um, observability, um, in my opinion, is very well defined in the Honeycomb website. Uh, it's defined as, uh, in the world of software products and services, observability means you can answer any questions about what's happening on the inside of the system just by observing the outside of the system without having to ship new code in order to answer new questions. Now, I'm going to put an asterisk, kind of go back to that uh, without having to ship new code piece in the in, in, in a bit, because it, it, it actually implicitly um, uh, says a lot of things about the way we observe our software. Uh, but for now, after we've properly defined what observability means, the ability to uh, know what's happening from the uh, what's happening inside the system by looking at the outside of the system, let's look at the actual tooling, the things we actually use in order to gain observability. So the first one and kind of the most common one is passive observation. You have an application, you don't want to know what's happening, you look at the logs, right? That's the kind of foremost thing you do. You open the, the, the logs and see what's up. And um, as the tooling in the DevOps space uh, kind of improves and advances and more and more stuff are going, getting rolled into production, um, we have an enrichment happening of this existing data. So you have, for example, APM systems that allow you to have, you know, kind of uh, variations of the data displayed to you in various formats. 
We have graphing systems. So we have real-time databases like Prometheus on and on top of them, uh, stuff like Grafana that enables you to dashboard everything you want to see in, in a very nice way that's uh, developer friendly. Um, we also have logging aggregators like Logs.io um, and a logging analy analytic tool that are associated with it, uh, tools that take the exact amount of information the application reveals about itself, filter it, analyze it, allow you to uh, inspect it better. And in some cases, more advanced companies also have these machine learning algorithms that go through the logging and bubble up the relevant information. Um, the problem with passive observation as a, as a whole is that it's, it's kind of limited to the left side of the SDLC, if you'd like. So you have the left where the developers live and the right where the production software lives. And I think that if you look at the left-hand side, this is where you devise, you plan, you control, if you'd like, all of the different parts of your application. You decide what you want to log, what you want to instrument, what you want to measure, and what you want to trace. And once you've defined that, that information gets pushed to the pipeline and deployed into, into production without uh, you uh, being able to change it um, midway, right? So you're kind of stuck in a sense with information you find on the left, looking at it on the right. And this leaves us a lot of the time with missing pieces of the puzzle. You're looking at your code and you're looking at your application story and you're saying, I wish I had that log line there. or I wish I added that metric there. or I wish I knew what X does instead of having to ask the application consistently uh, what it does by adding more and more logging. Uh, one way to kind of you know, get away from this passive observation uh, way of looking at the world is a replication and reproduction. So that basically means trying to reproduce the bug locally. So let's say there's an issue in production, there's an instance or a server running that uh, piece of software. What you do is you try and pull that same base configuration, that same base piece of infrastructure running the software and replicate it locally, and then try and reproduce the bug on top of it. This has a myriad of problems. First of all, it's not that easy. Uh, in many cases, this exact set of configuration and the exact set of uh, thing running in production doesn't replicate well locally. And even if it does, and you've built your software in a way that's easily replicable, the bug itself might not reproduce. And if you're looking at, for example, multi-tenant SAS, um, you have these users coming in with weird request parameters that trigger these weird code flows that you've never seen before. And the only way to exactly reproduce the bug is figure out exactly what's going on on that end of the, of the pipeline figure out exactly what's going on on the right and try and replicate it uh, locally. And anyone who's done that for, for in enough, well, enough times know that it, it's, it's cumbersome, it's rather manual, and it's exhausting, to be perfectly honest. Um, and so as a discipline, we came with solutions. One way is a very kind of brute force-ish type of way, which is hard fixing. You add more code to your code in order to better understand it your code. Now, the amount of code I said in this sentence is not accidental. There is just an addition of code that doesn't actually uh, enforce any new logic, right? It's, it's read-only, basically. What we're saying is we'll add more information in order to understand more information about our code. And this blows up our application. And more importantly than that, uh, there is a gap of time between the moment you add your information and the moment you see it in production. And that gap of time is crucial. If you're working in a server, in a company that has an SLA that says the app time has to be X number of nines after the dot, then every second that you're waiting for that hot fix to deploy is another second your, pro, your, um, uh, your, your service is not properly functioning. You're extending uh, and lo making longer the MTTR and basically um, reducing the availability of the service. Um, not to mention the fact that if all we want to do is get more information, why do we need to change our code? That doesn't really make any sense, right? All I want is this piece of information that I, oh, so I'm adding this code that I will then need to roll back because I don't really want it to be kept late, right? I'm adding more logs, which costs more money and logging is becoming extremely expensive these days. So there is also, again, a midway solution, a compromise, something we can do instead. And that's remote debugger. A remote debugger is, is pretty similar to your local debugger, so like in your IntelliJ or whatever ID you use, uh, in the sense that it allows you to add breakpoints. Breakpoints are, points inside the process that um, denote a stopping point in which you can kind of stop, take a look, and observe the environment. And uh, the problem with remote debuggers is, by definition, they break. They break your software. They stop it. And by stopping the process for something that might be as simple as you know, one edge case that might have you know, triggered a, a weird flow of code, a weird uh, path through the code, um, might be a bit kind of like a nuclear option in a sense. It's, it's a bit much in order to get what you want to get, which is more visibility and more understanding into the running service. Um, and 
uh, remote debuggers also have um, a set of uh, other problems that uh, that are uh, associated with them. Um, that again, depending on the amount, depending on your infrastructural, uh, you also need to instrument it. You need to get it into production, and a bunch of other stuff that might prevent you from actually adding it to your production software. Some companies don't even allow the use of a remote debugger for the for uh, performance reasons and other things that might hinder the running application. Um, and again, we came up as a discipline with a way to uh, add let's say, um, prevention mechanisms to the applic to applications that allow us to make sure that when something bad happens or the inevitable happens, basically, we solve it automatically. And I'm using the word automatically when I should probably be using the word automatically, because this is not actually a foolproof solution. Um, the, the best example of self-filling is Kubernetes liveness, I think. So you have a kubelet inside a node, and that kubelet uh, is in charge of kind of like probing everything and help doing health checks. And if a container is acting up, let's say a container um, I don't know, does something wrong, um, then the kubelet can know and then ask it to be restarted. Um, but what happens sometimes, it, sometimes it helps, sometimes it's, you know, it's a perfect solution for, for the problem, but with more complex bugs, with something that's a bit more nuanced, the more juicy stuff, um, just, just prop up back again once the container is restarted. It's, again, it's not a foolproof solution. And the problem is with the premise. There's a naive underlying premise here that states that we will be able to expect and predict every single thing that can go wrong, meaning we can add health checks for every single thing that can go wrong, and therefore we will be able to fix everything that can go wrong. And this, I think, is, again, this um, assumption that is wrong from the core, is wrong from the base, because it, it helps in many cases, as do the other tools that I just mentioned, right? All of these tools help in many cases, but they're not a complete foolproof solution. They're just there to help us um, mitigate the existing situation. And one thing that deserves kind of an honorary mention inside this context is alerting. Um, so we talk about pull right now, like a pull interface. What happens if we swap the pull for a push? So instead of having to pull the information towards us, we uh, get it, uh, sorry, to, to us, we can get it pushed towards us. And uh, the way it's done is usually via dedicated tooling. Um, uh, Slack alerting is one, you have PagerDude, you have this enormous amount of alerting tools, uh, email notifications also, uh, depending on how you instrument it, it's, it's, it's pretty wide. Um, there's a pretty wide kind of array of tools you can use. Um, and the problem with alerting is, is twofold. First and foremost, positive, uh, false positive is a real issue. So you configure an alert, and then it keeps on triggering for reasons that are, don't actually mean there's an underlying problem. And often you can't know that the thing you measured for, the thing you are alerting for, usually some metric that passes a benchmark, is actually not a bad thing. It can happen sometimes on routine operation of the program. And um, without knowing that in advance, it might just cause a flood of notifications to flood into your inbox every day, causing actual fatigue for your on-call people and the people on the front line fighting the good fight. Um, one extra thing is, again, this notion of defining the alerts on the left-hand side, basically in this time, not in development, but in configuration, and then seeing them on the right when they're pushed back into you. And a lot of the time, the context you've defined on the left is not enough on the right. You don't understand all of the different pieces you need to know in advance in order to solve the problem this alert prompted you to. And after kind of reviewing all of these pieces of tooling, it, there's, there's a sense that each of them is, again, great for its own use, great by its own, great as kind of, um, um, they all fit together in this like nice puzzle, if you will, of different things you can do with your production applications. But I think, again, as a discipline, like we came up with this concept of CICD and pipelines and DevOps, we can afford ourselves a re-examination of observability. So going back for a second to that definition that we talked about in the beginning, um, if observability can be defined, as the ability to understand how your system works on the inside without shipping new code. How can we redefine it? How can we create something here that enables us to better understand it without all the nuances and the uh, cumbersomeness that is, is usually involved? Um, continuous observability solves this exact problem. Uh, continuous observability is the streamlined process for constantly asking new questions and getting immediate answers. So think about it like a, kind of an, an upgrade of all the relevant tools that we, we just talked about. But instead of having to either break the service or ship new code or play around with missing information, you have this thing that enables you to pretty much understand what's going on in real time and um, on demand. And once you've kind of uh, 
accepted that we, we deserve a better process. We deserve something that we can better um, uh, incorporate in our process and our, in our work life. Um, there's a kind of a notion that stems right on top of it. So continuous debugging is about understanding what's going on, basically getting more and more visibility into the running service without actually stopping or degrading the customer experience. So if you remember Baruch, little smiley face at the end of the deck there, um, what we're trying to do is make sure that the customer is happy. And incidents are going to happen. That's a fact of life. Things are going to go wrong. That's okay. Nobody's saying that all services might have must have 100% uptime. Not everything is a pacemaker. Everything that's not a pacemaker, or uh, there's probably other examples that I'm missing here, but you get the point. Everything that's not a pacemaker, um, uh, we can afford a small amount of customer experience being degraded, but not a whole lot. So it is our job to minimize the amount of time and the amount of pain our customers suffer. In order to uh, while we while we fix while we fix the bugs and the and the relevant issues and this notion of continuous debugging allows that it allows us to kind of get more and more visibility without breaking the service and um, again I come from Lightrun and that's exactly what we do we've built a continuous observability and debugging toolbox it's a suite of tools you can use in real time on demand on your application you know to better understand what's going on inside of it and you know a picture is worth a thousand words i'm just going to show a small diagram of, of explaining how it works so instead of this manual hot fixing ish um a concept or this kind of myriad of tools that we talked about before instead of having to insert new code in order to add more visibility go through the entire pipeline run your application deploy it and then get the answer going through this entire cycle which can take minutes, hours, depending on the length of your pipeline. What Lightra enables you to do is add code level information and receive the answers in real time. So coming back to this notion of continuous debugging, what we're doing is adding more and more visibility into the running service without stopping on degrading the customer experience. And in addition, we have this process now using Lightra that enables you to ask new questions and get immediate answers right back. Um, now, uh, again, if the picture is worth 100 words, a demo is worth 100 pictures, and that's exactly what we're going to do. Uh, and uh, so we've prepared this uh, demo that combines both the capabilities of JFrog, which gets you from dev to prod, and Lightrun, which ensures you stay on prod as, as long as possible and with the, the highest degree of service, the highest quality sorry, of service um, available. Now, before I jump in, Bauch, do you have anything to add? I was on mute. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah no, that was, uh, but I mean, you, you touched on everything and uh, I'm uh, really looking forward to see, to see the demo because the pain is real and the solutions are not optimal. Let's see if you can provide us with the silver bullet. Right. So, um, I've, I would be very happy if, the, if, if, if we would call this a, a silver bullet. That would be a great compliment. Uh, and before we kind of dive in, I want to make sure that um, you understand the kind of the lay of the land. So what we're going to look at in a moment is the is an application that uh, is pretty well known. Uh, if it's a if anybody knows the Spring framework, it's a, it's a Java framework uh, that enables you to build all sorts of cool stuff. And most of the tutorials, or a lot of the tutorials, are based around this uh, Spring Pet Clinic application. And the Spring Pet Clinic is, uh, unsurprisingly, an application to manage pet clinics. Um, and uh, this specific demo is built around the microservices version of that application. And uh, the microservices version of this application has the actual application containers, which we'll talk about in a second, and all of these niceties that we can add in order to better understand what's going on. Uh, inside our infrastructure. So I'll just explain them briefly so it kind of makes sense what we're looking at, and then I'm going to go right ahead with the demo. Uh, so first and foremost, you have entities inside your application. You have visits, which are customers coming into the store, to the pet clinic, sorry, um, and uh, getting their pets in for a treatment of some sort. You have uh, veterinarians, which are people who work in the pet clinic, and you have customers, owners of pets. Each of those entities are encapsulated inside services, blocked inside of containers, encapsulated sorry, inside of containers, uh, and those uh, kind of uh, um, those services are uh, accessed via a central API gateway. So instead of touching on those services directly, as is very common in, in microservices architecture, um, you call an API gateway and it calls the downstream services. In addition, just for the sake of kind of reducing complexity, the UI, the user interface for the customer, is baked right inside uh, the API gateway controller. Uh, uh, container, sorry. Um, and the niceties that I mentioned before are first and foremost an admin server that allows you to administer various spring functionalities. We have a tracer, Zipkin. A tracer is a way to kind of observe all the um, 
API calls one by one as they drop down the down the stream. Uh, and this is um, very good for microservices ar ar architectures because you can see exactly what prompted what and identify problems. We'll get back to the tracer in a minute. Uh, we have a config server, which is a way to kind of host um, configuration externally, basically make sure that everybody can fetch the configuration whenever they spin up. And we have a service discovery um, a container, which is basically a repository that says, where are all the things? Uh, and before we ask this about it, I think we can now um, basically dive uh, dive right in. Uh, I'm going to go. Good. Yes, please. Uh, so, uh, by the way, if you have any questions about the demo or basically anything regarding this, please wait and uh, put them in the Q and A box so we can talk about them uh, later on. Um, uh, and of course, if you don't have the time to uh, to to, uh, to put it in the Q and A, feel free uh, to message uh, either me or Baruch uh, using our uh, handles, and we can uh, add any more information. As yeah, well. but it reminds me, I missed completely the entire housekeeping items in the beginning. I was so excited to dive in, <laughs> so I didn't even mention the Q and A box. But thank you for for doing that. And yes, sure. uh, any questions you have, Q and A box, put them here. We will take as much as possible towards the end. And right. uh, yeah, Tom, go ahead. Right. So we are kind of getting there on time. We're already about 30 minutes in. So I'm going to go ahead with, with demo and I'm going to leave about 10 minutes at the end uh, for questions. Uh, this demo will be in uh, three parts. I'm going to show you a simple bug, then a more complicated bug, show you what you can do with Lytra in order to figure them out. And then at the end, we're going to push a fix to production. And Bauch is going to talk a little bit about J4 pipelines and how you can you know, get that fix that you got so fast uh, to work um, back into your production application. And um, they Actual application we're working on is this Spring Pet Clinic. You can see there's a welcome screen here. Um, this uh, uh, welcome screen has a few different things you can do with it. You can look at all the owners. You can look at all the veterinarians and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but let's try and do something interesting. Um, so say that this customer, her name is uh, Betty Davis. Betty Davis, for some reason, was inserted into the system incorrectly. So her name is not actually Betty Davis. It's actually Betty Smith. Why? I don't know. Something, somebody made a mistake. So what I would like to do is go into the uh, the application and change the last name from Davis to, sorry, from Davis to uh, Smith, which is what I'm going to do now. I'm going to submit, and when I submit, I expect the name inside the owner details window to change to Betty Smith, which uh, of course, because this is uh, not something that we didn't plan for, um, what happens is the name in the uh, in the form is actually Betty Betty. Now. Again, this is not very complicated. What happens was the last name was swapped with the first name, right? It's very clear to what happened. But the reason behind it might not be as clear. And I'll explain. It could be a UI bug. It could be that the information was incorrectly inserted into the back. It could be that the information was incorrectly retrieved from the back. Lots of different things uh, can happen here. So again, keep in mind that this is me. Uh, I am. This is my application. I might not have developed all the features in it, but I know it pretty well. So I know that what happens when uh, you uh, look at the UI, if you, if I want to understand where this information is coming from, there's an APA call, go, goes to the back and brings back the, the information about uh, this owner. So one thing I can do, I have the network pane open here. I can uh, look for the relevant um, the relevant query and web, uh, inspect whether the information came in correctly from the back. Basically check if it's a UI bug. And in this case, it's not a UI bug because you can see that the first name and the last name in this pretty pretty JSON here is Betty and Betty. That's no bueno, right? That's not good. Uh, what we'd like to do is like to understand how that came to be. Keep in mind that what happened was we edited a form and once we edited a form, what happened was the information was inserted incorrectly. Now this means that probably there's a problem with the edit form. So what I'm going to try and do is do another edit but this time, I'm going to look at the, it will be probably either a put or a post, right? If you're sending information back to the back, it's usually either a put or a post. So I'm going to try and change the name again to Betty uh, Smith. 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 And when I uh, submit it, I'm going to look for uh, a put request or something uh, of that sort. And we have a put request here indeed. Um, well, the table is kind of slow to load. We might have to circle back to that in a bit. Uh, and this put method goes into, I'm going to hide my uh, zoom window, that put method goes into uh, the API gateway and specifically into the owner slash two uh, endpoint. So uh, logically that two is not actually a two, it's not hard code as a two, it's probably a dynamic variable of some sorts. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to now go look into the code, see what happens when we actually do this put. And when I go into my code, I have this API gateway controller, which is the main interface to our application. We'll talk about it in a second, but on the right, you can see the Lightroom sidebar, and on the bottom, the Lightroom console. We'll talk about these um, in a bit. 
And what we can do now is we can try and get that put mapping. So I'm going to look for a put mapping. And you see that the put mapping uh, for owner's owner ID is here. And it does a very simple thing. It goes to something. Again, I might not be familiar with the entire code called the customer service client. I'm going to make the outrageous claim that it is a client for the customer service. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the method to see what it actually does. And when I look into it, there's a method here, unsurprisingly called update owner, that goes and does a put into the customer service slash owner slash owner ID service. Now, remember, this is a, I'm gonna show the, sorry, I'm gonna show that screen again. Remember that this is a microservice architecture and there's a customer service right here that is in charge of doing all the customer work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into here and I'm going to look in the, inside the customer service uh, folder and I'm gonna do a find it path and I'm going to look for a put and that put will obviously be for the same owner ID as it's mentioned right here so I'm going to click it and see exactly what's happening here so um, a keen eye might observe the problem already right but let's say this is not this very simple uh, piece of code but there was a lot of logic going on maybe we're not populating the model using um, uh, some very simple logic but we have something more complex here maybe an external call which makes it not that evident what is wrong what we could do is we could add a light electron lightron sorry a uh, snapshot lightron snapshot. And uh, we're going to place it on top of the customer service. You know, we have a tagging me mechanism that allows you to tag all your relevant resources. Um, and when I do that, uh, and uh, you will see immediately this little blue box turn here, um, the owner resource snapshot uh, of 4 line 88 is now registered under the customer service tag. And remember, this is happening in real time, right? So I need to invoke that put method. The easiest Tom, way to sorry to interrupt you. One question. Of uh, course. Someone asked to increase the font on the... Uh, in the idea if you can do that. Yes, of course, of course, no problem. Editor, font, and let's make it like 60. I think that would be okay. Uh, is that better? There we go. Much better, thank yeah, you. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so what happens is, um, what was I right? A snapshot. So we've added snapshot here. And remember, a snapshot is like some, something like, uh, not remember, I actually didn't mention it. So a snapshot is kind of like a virtual breakpoint. So instead of what will you will do with a remote debugger, which is putting a breakpoint in the gutter here, and then uh, breaking the service and inspecting the, the, the environment. What this allows you to do is invoke the method. And I will do so by actually adding a put here. I'm going to add a put. Uh, invoke the, the put method. And remember the API gateway is then called, which then called the customer service. And then immediately I can see the relevant information right in front of me. So what we basically need to do is check two things. We need to check how the request came in and we need to check what the model did. So what got persisted and what came in and where the differentiation happened. So there are two important pieces here, the owner request and the owner model. And it's clear that the owner request did indeed come in correctly. So it, it was it came in to the to the relevant um, um, sorry method using uh, with the Betty Smith values. But when I look at the model, you immediately see that this information is incorrect. Um, and again, a keen eye would have would have observed it beforehand. But what we could do is we could search for last name, see where it happens, and it's immediately clear that the information um, was incorrectly set. So instead of setting the last name to the last name, we are setting the last name to the first name. This is a very simple fix. What I do is I change the set from a get less first name to a get less name, and this should fix the problem. Now, again, remember, if this, uh, if this was a bit, a bit more uh, complicated code, you would have to uh, figure out exactly which interaction did what. And I think this is a very good um, uh, uh, kind of a simple uh, to grasp example of exactly how snapshots work. But let's talk about something a bit more juicy. Let's talk not about um, an, an incorrect data bug, but about a performance bug. And uh, as I kind of hinted to, uh, to it before, the owner's table populates really, really slowly. So I'm going to refresh the table, and when I refresh it, uh, oh my god, it's so slow. Uh, oof. Oh, come on. Uh, all right, so now it's refreshed, and uh, the best way to understand exactly what's going on with the request is by observing the waterfall inside Chrome DevTools, which I do. Uh, and if I look at the timing here, you can see the time to first byte is 9.89 seconds for a total time of 10.19 seconds. That's completely unacceptable for any web application. Uh, not any web application, but this type of web application. Even if there are thousands of owners in a pattern, which might happen over time, you can't expect the entire table, this thing that we use on a daily basis to load after uh, 10 seconds. That's very, uh, a very long time. And now comes in this concept of like run books, right? So depending on what it is uh, your company, your company's procedures are set up to do, depending on what it is um, you'd like, you are kind of used and, and are accustomed to doing, there are a few different approaches you can take. You can 
maybe look at the database. It might be that the query plan is unoptimized for some reason. You might look at the server running the APIs, making sure that it works okay. It might be a problem between the API and the other API gateway. Uh, it, there might be a, a few different things here. Um, but I think that for microservices application, uh, the first thing you do is you look at the tracer. Right. There are traces that tell you exactly which points in the road were taken right after that call. So again, as, 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 uh, as we talked before, this is a call to slash owners, so API gateway slash owners. So I have Zipkin, which is an open source tracer. I can run a query that tells me exactly um, all the recent queries that happened. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the relevant query. And unfortunately, Zipkin doesn't tell me much. Uh, all it tells me is that I made a call to the API gateway owners. Okay, and then two follow-up calls happen, one to the customer service and one to the visit service. But you can see here, and this is a very kind of tell that the problem is a bit more kind of nuanced. Uh, you can tell that the customer service only took 131 milliseconds and the visit service only took 70 milliseconds, which might be long uh, subjectively, but in this context, it's not, uh, objectively, sorry, but in this context, it's, it's not that long because that 9.7 second totally encapsulates. So what can, what can a person do? You look at the code. Uh, so remember, again, this is a get calling to the API gateway controller. I'm gonna go back to the API gateway controller and I'm gonna look for a get mapping. Let's look at all of them. And obviously I can see that this get mapping gets me uh, the owners. Now, the, this is not a code smell, but it's, it is weird. So what I would expect is like the update uh, method went into the customer service and did the update. What I expect is for the get method to go to the customer service and do a get. Um, this is not actually what happens. There's another method here, add owners future visits, which again, depending on your application, depending on the level of complexity, might or might not be a code smell. I'm not exactly sure, um, but it, it does raise a concern, right? So I'm, I go back to the application and I try to understand what, what, what that thing actually does. And immediately it's, it's clear that there's a future visits count column here. And I would make the valid assumption that the two might be correlated. But again, I don't know, right? Because I don't actually have metrics that tell me how long each of those methods run. Well, with Lightrun, you can. Uh, again, we, have a suite, we, we offer the suite of tools that you can use in order to better understand each and every kind of edge case that happens in your code in real time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure how long those methods took to run. So the two options here, deep or wide. So I chose to go wide. Deep would be to inspect the customer service client get owners like I did before. So follow the API gateway uh, for the uh, call from the API gateway deep inside the other uh, API, deep inside the other services. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on the controller. I'm going to see if I can detect inside this controller without actually leaving the file, which method here takes the longest. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a method duration metric here. I'm going to call it get owners because I'm going to want to uh, differentiate it from the rest. I'm going to place it under the API gateway tag. So it's because, well, this happens in the API gateway, I'm surprised me. I'm going to click okay. A blue uh, circle, a blue clock, sorry, will uh, rise up here and you can see that it's registered here. By the way, um, uh, tags are used for multi-instances. So for example, if you have uh, this many, many customer service instances, you can tag them all with customer service. And then uh, all of those same actions will be propagated down the line to each of the instance. Um, and this is the list of agents, which are the actual services running. In this specific infrastructure, we only have one service per customer, one, uh, yeah, one service per entity, sorry. So one customer service, one vet service, one visit service and the like, but the propagation happens once you apply the tag. And let's look at this add owners future visits, look for it and it happens here. We can also time that one just to figure out exactly uh, what's going on. So I'm going to time that and call that um, add owners future uh, visits. Awesome. And again, I'm going to place it under the API gateway, which will pop up that one again. And let's look at the other methods here. Where is that get future visits thing being used? Uh, it's used in here too. So we're going to, it's used inside the, uh, the upper method, the higher method, sorry. So I'm going to place another duration right here. I'm doing a sort of binary search, if you will. I'm kind of trying to detect, before I actually look at the code, I'm trying to understand which portion of the code was problematic. And this method duration kind of step-by-step -step iterative process allows me to uh, kind of like what you did with the traces before, instead of tracing the API calls, I'm tracing the methods. Um, so I'm going to add a get future visits here. I'm going to put it under the gateway. And remember, again, this is in real time, which means I need to invoke the, cell, the those, um, I need to invoke the uppermost method, which is this one, the get mapping, in order for this to run. Uh, and we're kind of running out of time, so I'm going to do this really fast. I'm going to refresh uh, the all owners view again. And what I'm going to see is in my Lightrun console, uh, so I'm going to move this Slack, this Zoom window. Uh, what happens is if I 
if I search for the get owners method, um, in a moment now, you will see that the amount of invocations, the time of invocation of the method is one. And it ran for, this is in milliseconds, it ran for about 12,368 milliseconds, so 12 seconds. This by itself doesn't get me a lot of information. Something deeper down is causing problems. So let's look at the next function, uh, the next method, sorry, uh, which I'm going to do now. I'm going to do add on future visits. And uh, as you can see, this method as well ran once, it was invoked once. And remember, we only ran the whole process once, so that makes sense. And also for 12,228, which is not very indicative, like I, I can't do a lot with it. Let's go deeper down the stack. And uh, if that if that didn't work, then I'd probably have to go deep instead of wide. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for the uh, get future visits, get future visits method. And voila, this method has been invoked 1000 times with each invocation taking 11 milliseconds. Now this uh, happens um, sequentially, means, meaning that um, it will take uh, in entirety, this uh, the run each invocation, the total amount of invocation of these methods will take around um, something like eleven seconds. So, this is obviously the cause of the bug, right? We now know that if we can shave the amount of uh, uh, time that this method takes, we will shorten the entire uh, cycle dramatically. Um, I'm not going to bother you with the details. There, there's a code logic problem here. I'm going to leave it for a few seconds if somebody uh, wants to look. It's an, an, an inefficient algorithm, but because we're really running out of time and I really want to make sure that uh, J, um, sorry, Bao gets to talk a little bit about JFrog, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to grab the fix that I made uh, pre uh, beforehand and I'm going to paste it into my API gateway controller. And uh, what will happen is I need to uh, import this one, uh, which I will. Uh, and then what I can do is simply uh, push. And because this entire thing has been deployed using uh, JPOC patterns, which Bao will talk about in a second, all that's left to do is just add, commit, and push, which I will do right now. And uh, Bao, uh, I think it's your uh, time to take it away. Uh, you're muted though, so maybe unmute yourself. I am muted. Yes. yes. So uh, yeah, so you pushed it to JFrog pipelines, and maybe we'll talk just a little bit, couple of minutes about what JFrog pipeline is. One of the questions in the Q and A that we are going to answer through this is what um, CI/CD stands for, and CI/CD stands for continuous integration slash continuous delivery, or sometimes continuous deployment. And there is slight difference between those two terms. A lot of people use it interchangeably and, and, and it's fine. So this is what actually JFrog Pipeline is. Um, it's, it's more than that. It's more of an orchestration tool that can not only build and do the continuous integration by itself, but also uh, can use other tools like Jenkins, for example, to run the builds themselves and then kind of orchestrate it. What we see here is an is is a, um, a pipeline of your application, Tom, and we can see how all those different microservices are built here and then deployed together. And uh, um, we can we can look at at one of them, or we can we can look at the definition of this pipeline through the YAML um, DSL and actually talk a little bit about that here. So you can see here how um, JFrog Pipeline is a declarative tool. You see that everything is described uh, through, um, uh, through YAML and you can see here the steps. So the steps here are the steps that you see in the UI. So obviously we will see three types of steps here and here they are the build um, uh, Docker, uh, the build microservice itself, and then push this microservice, and then eventually somewhere down there it will be deployed. So we see the steps for each and every one of them. Now, um, interesting stuff to know about Jeffro Pipeline is uh, that is a declarative tool. You can see here how the type is Maven build. Well, my my annotating skills are, are horrible. Um, let's... Uh, okay, so Maven build, here we go. That's a little bit better, right. Maven build is a type that we know how to do inside JFrog pipeline. And, and we have tons of those types of steps, including obviously all the um, build uh, uh, tools that we support in Artifactory, um, Maven, NPM, a Docker, 
uh, .NET uh, with with NuGet, you name it. For all of those, we have like types, and then we don't really need to tell what to do uh, to to this to this tool because we already know. And the interesting part to see here are the input steps and the output steps. The input steps and the output steps are, sorry, the input resources and the output resources are what those uh, steps take and what they produce. So here the input resources are um, uh, the, the, are uh, our, the sources, obviously, because we need to build something and also integration. Integration is how this step in the pipeline is connected with other tools. So here, for example, we need Maven repositories in our artifactory to retrieve the dependencies and to deploy the artifacts. So we declare them as integrations, and then we say, hey, we need sources, and then it knows what to do. And this is this is very cool. The, the next step is of type bash. Type bash means it's open, you can do whatever you like, we need credentials, just a pair of username and password. So those will be our integrations. And the input steps will be the previous step. This is the relationship between the steps. And then this, this is just a bunch of shell commands of bash commands that we run. Again, this is something that you can do um, in a typed, uh, in a typed type of step because we have Docker push as a typed step, but we can obviously also do, do it in Bash. Another interesting thing to say about Jeffrey pipelines, and this is where I stop to leave some questions, to, uh, some time for questions and answers, is that it's a container-based pipeline. It means that the entire thing run as uh, containers in a Kubernetes cluster by default, but you can also bring your own um, clusters or or even a, a, a bare metal to run on. But by default, it's a Kubernetes cluster of pods. Every pod runs containers that run those builds. And not only you can select which containers you want to run your builds on, and that obviously will provide some uh, infrastructure. It will be Ubuntu or Windows or Mac, but also each and every step, especially the typed step, will run in the right container. So for example, when we run a step of type Maven build, we'll make sure to provide you with container that has Java and Maven. And um, if you run a NuGet build or, or um, um, what's it called, a PowerShell, we will make sure that it have Windows and PowerShell. Not only that, that we guess which type of container you need for a certain type of, of step, you can pick and choose and bring your own container. You can say, I want to run this build on a container of my type that have the stuff that I actually need for this, uh, for this step. And this is obviously very powerful because then you can prepare those images in front, knowing exactly what tools you will need and employ them to run the steps that you want to run. And obviously, all the external integrations come through the integrations uh, ability of pipelines in which you declare kind of what you depend on in terms of credentials, in terms of uh, variables, in terms of all the stuff that you will need. And then you just throw them in, you declare them and as integrations. And then either the step itself, because it's typed, know how to use this integration, or you can use everything in this integration through environment variables in your custom steps like Bash or PowerShell. So I think this is kind of um, uh, sums it up. And now uh, let's see what questions do we have. And we have uh, we have plenty. So I think we answered what the CI/CD stands for. And um, here are some more. Um, okay, mo now you are on mute, I think. Yeah, now you are on mute. I am no longer muted. Hello. Yeah. All right. Okay. So here's a question. What is necessary to install on the server and in the ID to be able to use Lightrun? 
Uh, great question. So the architecture is uh, basically as follows. Uh, you know, you need to uh, install the Lightron uh, plugin on IntelliJ IDEA, as you just saw. Um, you also have a binary you need to uh, add to your pack when you package your application, uh, which basically spins up as an additional thread inside uh, the JGAVM, for example. Um, and then in addition, we have another server, the Lightron server, that uh, uh, we either uh, host for you or we can also uh, give you to uh, deploy on-prem. So basically three pieces of the puzzle. Um, the plugin, the client, if you will, um, the agent that is uh, uh, packaged in the application and the Lightroom server. And um, the follow-up question on that would be, what is the, um, what is the performance <coughs> overhead of, of Lightroom, especially the agent that you just, just mentioned? Right. Um, so uh, let's, let me just kind of... Uh, answer the question in two parts. So uh, the first part portion is what does the performance capping on Lightroom, which I think will answer the next question, which is how do, what, what, how the performance is capped. Um, we have a proprietary sandbox that makes sure that the, um, the resources being used by uh, Lightroom are capped. And it's, it's configurable. We have the same defaults, obviously, but we can cap um, the CPU. We can cap the amount of actual things being inserted, logs, for example, being inserted um, into the application and a myriad of other stuff. Um, so the, the, the Bottom line is that we have a mechanism that allow, enables you to cap and configure uh, what you will and will not allow Lightroom to, to use. Um, but I do want to take, there's another one that I really want to take, which is um, how can you make sure that personal information like CC numbers will not be revealed mm -hmm. in Lightroom snapshot? Mm -hmm. So this is a really interesting one. So um, think about what happens when you allow, uh, for example, a developer to uh, you, you work on, a, on, a, on something that involves sensitive uh, data, like for example, a credit card um, information. Um, th that, that means that you allow an entity that is not allowed, to, is allowed to be exposed to, inf to sensitive information to basically see it because if there's a problem in the service, what they will do is they will place a snapshot. And when they place a snapshot, they will see the entire information. Sorry about that. Um, there are two kind of levels of things we can um, we, we can help with in that regard. So the Lightroom sandbox includes um, a block list. And that block list basically says, please block Lightroom from this class method package, whatever line of level of granularity you'd like, which means no developer will be allowed to place a Lightroom uh, snapshots or log or anything else uh, there. Um, that's, that's kind of like the, um, uh, let's call it the more, um, granular approach that will allow you to kind of better mitigate each situation uh, according to the need. One thing that's a bit more rough, a bit more overarching is um, a PAI reduction. So personal, personally identifying information uh, reduction, which means that you can define a set of expressions that you want to look for in the output of Lightroom and say, whenever this appears, for example, a credit card, uh, a credit card number, please redact it. And that will allow you to have complete reduction inside your uh, logs. And this is comes uh, comes in, into play more when you uh, deploy the logs elsewhere. So let's say that you want, I showed you the piping into the console inside the ID, but we can uh, we can pipe into many other of our integrations like uh, Slack, Logs.io, um, Datadog and the like. So if you piped information over there and it's persisted somehow, you don't want that information to uh, contain sensitive data. Um, and that's where the PAI reduction kind of comes into play. Um, and I think that, pretty much covers that entire uh, that entire question. Uh, do you want to take the how you set up API gateway uh, question? Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think we skip this one as being a little bit off topic, but there is another one which is very interesting uh, about how Light, Lightrun integrates with, a other, um, with other observability tools. Right. Uh, like uh, if if the trace was already been captured by right. AppDynamics, Wiley, or others, can it be reused inside Light Right Run? Or generally, how Lightroom plays with other observability tools? Right. So it's like a side. It's a, it's a bidirectional question, basically. So um, what you said, the the base answer is you will need because we're running out of time. You'll need to reproduce the request outside of Lightroom. So Lightroom will assist you in um, with on-demand new data and metrics. So Apathy and Dynatrace will give you like um, uh, tracing data for. Uh, pretty fine traces and things that like common libraries give about themselves. Um, with Lightroom, you can get basically any data from business logic code. You're not limited to, to anything. Um, so uh, I hope that answers the question. Uh, and we can, of course, as I mentioned, DM are open, email are open, use them. Yeah, yeah and exactly. Then, so, yeah, exactly. absolutely. We, we were running out of time, so our answer ability is limited. But yeah. you know where to find us by now. So please go ahead and, and, and reach to us.
Um, and for for the questions about pipelines that we also have, again, we, we unfortunately don't have time to answer those, but uh, come to a dedicated JFrog Pipelines webinar when we will take more time to go through JFrog Pipelines, talk about its functionality and answer all the, mind, all the questions that you might have. Um, with that, you will get the recording and a link to um, different resources um, in, in, in a couple of days. Thank you. And a blog post, right. Thank you for, for being with us. Um, come to our future webinars of Lightrun and JFrog. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was very fun. Thank you very much. And bye-bye. All right. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Awesome.